Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Fahim Yaz, I'm the Product Manager for Anime Studio. Today's webinar is going to be an awesome webinar on Anime Studio 10. We just launched the product, uh, so we're looking forward to seeing all the new features in Anime Studio 10 and uh, we're doing the overview. Wanted to make sure to let you know that we have some special guests today, including Mike Clifton, who is the lead developer on the Anime Studio team, who will be discussing many of the features uh, today, as well um, Eric Long, who is another engineer on the team, and as well we have Eric Martin, uh, who is joining us as well. And uh, finally, we also have uh, Jason Cozy, who is our QA manager. Uh, many of you know who he is as well, and he'll be fielding questions later on. So one thing I wanted to mention to you guys is that feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar in the Q&A section. We will be answering all those questions at the very end. This webinar is going to last a little bit over an hour, so please be patient with us. Uh, there's a lot of features to cover, and uh, once the webinar is done and complete and the questions have been answered, we will be creating the video and we will be uploading it up on our uh, web page. So please make sure to check that out on anime. .smithmicro.com. And with that, let's get the webinar started. We're going to pass the mic over to Mike Clifton, our lead engineer. Hi, everybody. Um, this is Mike Clifton. I'm going to show you some of the new features in Anime Studio 10. The first thing I'm going to show you is uh, the activation system in Anime Studio. It's a little bit different in this version. When you first start up the program and it asks you to insert a serial number, you get this dialog, and this is our activation dialog. And what it asks you to do is to enter your name and email address. Um, if, uh, if you want to receive announcements about future product updates and things, <clears throat> excuse me, things from us, you can leave this box checked, otherwise you can uncheck it. Down here you'll enter the serial number for your product. And then there's a last option down here about sending analytics. And I just want to point out that this is very generic information. It includes things like um, your operating system version, your processor, how much RAM you have, GPU information, nothing personal, but things that can help us improve the product and sort of get an idea for what kind of systems people are using. So once you've done that, you click Activate, and the program's ready to go. So the activation system allows you to activate on up to three computers. So if you have a home computer and a laptop and uh, whatever you use at work, you can activate on those three. If you want to change which computers it's activated on, you can go to the Help menu and select uh, deactivate license. When you do that, it'll make sure you're you, you meant to deactivate. And once you're done, the program quits and it's no longer activated on this computer. But you can go ahead and activate it again just by going through the the serialization process of startup. So we're trying to make this very uh, simple and painless, and we think it's going to work very smoothly for everybody. Another thing that's new in Anime Studio 10 is our automatic update system. And there's nothing for me to show right now because it's version 10.0 and, and you know, there, there are no updates. But when we do have an update with bug fixes or new features, the program will notify you automatically. So you'll just get a notice that there's a new version available and you can choose whether to update to it. Um, and if you want to check manually, you can go in here in the Help menu again and choose Check for Updates. And I'll do that real quick, and it says it's currently the newest version available. So that way you can make sure that you're running the latest version at any time. So that'll be a lot easier than having to go to our website periodically and see if we've got something new. It'll just tell you when there's something new available. I'm going to move on to the content library. We have some new content included with the program for you to use in Anime Studio 10. If you go into the content library, you'll see in the characters section, we have all these um, promotional characters for Anime Studio 10. You may have seen them in some of our promotional videos. They're all available for you to use. You add them to your project. They have some cool animation built in. 
but you can go ahead and you can clear out the keyframes and animate them yourself. We also have um, a CK animal pack here. These were created by Charles Kenway, and there's a bunch of image-based animals. They're really cool, textured, painterly-looking things. Um, let me add him in and hide the monster. So these are all rigged, and they have animation too. So a lot of cool characters for you to play with there. In the scenes section, we have some really impressive things here. I'm going to close this file and uh, this is a really neat one here. Charles created this one as well. It's called Crustacea and if I bring this in you'll see it's a very sophisticated cinematic looking scene of uh, aliens or microscopic insect creatures. I'm not sure but uh, fantasy kind of image-based animation. We also have Smith Micro, if you haven't seen them, we do these holiday cards. and um, We've worked with Victor Parodies to create these animations. Um, we do them for Halloween, New Year's, that kind of thing. And they're all available in here in Anime Studio 10 so you can see how they were created. So I'll bring one of these in. And it's a, this is an animation of a vampire's home getting up to answer the door. If you haven't seen these, you should go to our website and check out some of our holiday videos. They're really cool. All right. Let's move on to some of the features in Anime Studio 10. First thing I'm going to show, this is sort of the biggest set of features because there's a whole bunch of sub-features, but these are all the new um, changes to the bone system. So what I have here is I have a rig that's sort of set up like maybe a camera crane. If you imagine this at the end is a camera. And you can see that as you move the bones, it moves as expected. And as I bend this arm down, the camera bends down. But maybe I don't want the camera to rotate like that. So what I can do is select the camera, and in the bone constraints panel here, I can say independent angle. And now when I move the rig, you can see that the camera automatically rotates to compensate and and stay level. So this is great for sort of a robotic mechanical rig or a camera, um, but I'm going to show you where else you might want to do something like that. The idea was for legs. So here's just an individual leg. Maybe get rid of that background texture. Um, when you move a leg, oh this one's already set up, but the idea is, when you normally move a leg, the foot moves with the shin. And when you're kicking, that's great. You know, you want to kick forward. But sometimes you would want the foot to stay flat. So you can turn on independent angle. And now, when I lift the leg up, you can see that the foot stays level with the floor. You might not always want that to happen. So if you, if you move up, the foot stays level, but then you can tweak it. You can always go in and make adjustments there and it'll hold that angle. The next uh, bone feature is a squash and stretch system. So here I have a bone set up in um, set up with an image bound to it. And Anime Studio has always let you scale bones so that you can stretch things longer or shorter. But now in Anime Studio 10, we've added a squash and stretch option. So the way that works is, again, here in the Bone Constraints panel, you can say Squash and Stretch Scaling. And I'll turn that on for this bone that's selected. And now, when I stretch it out, you can see that the bone is getting skinnier in the opposite direction. So it gets longer this way and thinner that way. And what it's doing is it's preserving the overall volume of the shape that's bound to it. So you get this automatic cartoony squash and stretch kind of effect. These are a lot of individual things, and in a couple steps here, I'm going to show you how they all pull together into a, into a set of features that can all be used together. The next one I'm going to show you is uh, smooth bending. 
So here I have two bones attached to an image layer. And you can see that when I bend these bones, I get kind of a pinch in the middle here. So with vector artwork, that's easy to correct. It may be time consuming, but you can move points around to correct that. With an image, there's not a lot you can do. You can sort of try and improve it by adjusting the strength of the bones, but there's still, you know, there's still kind of a pinch going on. So what we've added for Anime Studio 10 there are smooth joints. And this is how it works. You select the piece of artwork that you want to bend smoothly. Then you select two bones. The restriction of this feature is it only works with two bones that are lined up in a straight line. So the idea is sort of for arm, elbows, and knees kind of joints. So I select those two bones. And in the bone menu, I say create smooth joint for bone pair. And now I'm going to move the bones again. What you see now is you're not getting that pinching in the middle. You're getting a smooth joint as you bend the bones. And if I render a frame, you see it's even a little bit smoother. We have a little bit of a rough preview here on the canvas, but a, a very smooth, nice, clean bend in the rendered output. There's a neat trick you can do with this, too. Um, so this is, this is how it bends when the bones go through the center of the arm. But you can also do this. If I move the arm off center from the bones, and then I move the bones, I still get a smooth bend, but I get a, a much curvier bend because they're bending in a circle further away from the center point. So it's just sort of you can play with that and, and bend joints in interesting ways. Let's move on to bone targets. So here's a simple uh, bone rig. And when I animate something like this, let's say I um, grab the, the root bone here, so the legs are children of this bone, the feet just drift around like that, and they're not attached to the ground. So our solution in Anime Studio 10 is bone targets. We've had a, a bone locking system for a long time, but I think bone targets are a more flexible and powerful way of doing this. And so the way it works, I add two target bones for the feet. And they don't have to be feet. You can set these up however you want. But if I look at this now, and this is, uh, let's call this right target, and this one left target. So when I have this, I select this leg, the bottom of the leg, and I want it to always point to this target. So in the bone constraints, I say I want the target to be left target. And for this bone over here, I want the target to be right target. And I close that. Now when I go to animate, if I move the parent bone, you can see that the legs point to those targets no matter what. And if I move the targets, oops, if I move the targets, um, you can see that the legs also point to the targets. You may also notice that the feet are kind of drifting around. Um, and that goes back to our independent angle feature. So you have the feet drifting as you move the legs around. You might want to go back in here and tell the feet to have independent angles. So now the legs reach the targets and the feet aren't bending around. Let's move that floor line so we can see the feet. So the feet are now stable on the ground. You can see if I move far enough away, the feet, the legs, are still trying to point to the targets. They can't reach it, but they're, they're still aiming for the targets. All right. Now let's show how this all fits together. So here's a character um, that uses all these features together. See if I move him around. You can see that his legs are pointing to targets, just like our last character. The feet are set up with independent angles, um, although I can tweak them if I want to. The arms and legs have smooth joints, so they're bending nicely here at the elbows and the knees. 
Um, and all these features come together in a really good way for creating a character. Here he is animated with all the, the different components working together. So here the to make him walk, the targets, let's select one of the targets, you can see that the target is animated over time. It's sort of moving in these these bumps over time. And the feet, the legs just follow those targets. So that's a whole bunch of uh, bone features all all pulled together. There's probably a lot to digest there, but um, between independent angle, um, smooth joints, targets, uh, squash and stretch, it all, all makes for a good combination. And you know what, I realized that there's one other thing I didn't show you. Um, let's go back to this version without animation. Um, now watch here, as I move the character upwards, you can see his legs stretch. So what this is, this is a feature called IK stretching. So I'm going to go into the um, constraints panel again. Maximum IK stretching. By default, this is set to 1. So for this leg, I'm going to put it back to 1. And what that means is when, a, when bones are trying to reach a target, if their stretching is set to more than one, they will stretch by that amount in order to reach the target. So this leg is not stretching, and this one is. So it gives you a nice cartoony squash and stretch effect if you have a character that, that um, is stepping up tall or jumping or something like that. And it's all automatic once you turn it on. So that's bone constraints. Um, I'm going, to set a, I'm going to switch over to another file to show you one more bone feature. This is smart bone setup. So hopefully a lot of you, if you're uh, Anime Studio veterans, have been using smart bones for a while. They're a powerful way to um, separate and blend animations together. We've added something in Anime Studio 10 to make this a little bit easier. So let's say we want some smart bones to control this star. What I can do is I can just draw a bone and then go to the bone menu and say make smart bone dial. Now this feature is for when you don't want the bone to be sort of a limb of a character. I'm not going to use this bone to bend the star. I'm going to use it as a control dial. So I say make smart bone dial and I give it a name. So let's call this one Kirby. And you can choose a minimum and maximum angle. I'm going to say 0 to 90 and it'll go over 100 frames. I'll click OK. And this just did a bunch of um, sort of smart bone bookkeeping that you used to have to do by yourself. Setting up an action, um, putting in angle constraints, giving it a name, um, putting in the keyframes in the action, setting the influence down to zero. It basically does everything you need to set this up as a smart bone dial. So then I can go in and I can just uh, edit the, the shapes in response to that smart bone action. So let's go in and add another one here. Let's add another bone and we're going to call this one green. And so it set up everything it needs. And for this one I'm going to take the star and I'm just going to change its color. So now I have two smart bones and I can blend them together so I can make it curvy and green in whatever combination I want. And these are just control dials that you can use to animate the properties of this shape. And people have been using smart bones for this kind of thing or for animating facial expressions, head turns, all kinds of things. And this way it just makes it easy to skip a lot of the busy work with setting up smart bone dials. All right. Let's talk about some of the new interpolation features. We have a few new interpolation modes in Anime Studio 10. The first one is bounce. So let's look at this animation. Um, there's only two keyframes, a starting and an ending one. And this ball is just moving downwards to the bottom of the screen. 
What if I wanted to make it bounce when it hit the bottom? Well, previously I'd have to add a bunch of keyframes in the middle. <clears throat> and it could be hard, you know, you don't just want it up and a down, you want to make a smooth curve. It sort of takes a lot of fiddling. But now all you have to do is right click on the keyframe and select bounce as the interpolation type. Then you have a couple options, how many times to bounce and how high the bounce should be. So the default is to bounce three times and each bounce is uh, half the height of the previous one. So when I do this, I get a nice automatic little bounce. And there's still only two keyframes, so it's really easy to, to change the timing if I want it to bounce faster. I just move the one keyframe in slower, I move it out, and you don't have to mess with hundreds of keyframes. In the motion graph, you can see what's going on. We have just the keyframe again at the beginning and the end, but you can actually see the bounce happening here. We have another type of uh, interpolation called elastic. So here's a simple scene with three objects sliding into place, and it's a little boring. They just they slide in straight movement. But what I can do is we just look at one of them first. Um, we just look at this egg shape. If I select its first keyframe here and set it to elastic interpolation, again it has a bounce count, but we'll see here that the bounce is a little different. So it overshoots uh, its target and then swings back again and bounces a few times. So I can do that for these um, other shapes as well. The text, I can select a couple keyframes here and say elastic. And when they, they all bounce into place, it just gives it a more cartoony effect than uh, it did with the simple smooth interpolation. So that's elastic. And it, um, I've been moving objects, but you can use bat bounce and elastic on anything. You can have a, a color bounce or the opacity bounce or um, anything you can animate. One more thing about interpolation here is uh, an option called stagger. So here's a, a simple animation of a skeleton standing up lifting a barbell. Now it's, it's a smooth movement, it doesn't look like he's struggling at all. A technique that animators have used, classical animators have used, um, we've added here called stagger. Now stagger is a little bit different from an interpolation type because you can choose whatever interpolation type you want and then stagger it separately. So when I choose stagger, you see a little jagged line here indicating the stagger. And here's what it looks like. Um, I'm not sure how this streams through the webinar, if you can see too well, but um, it makes for a, a more jagged interpolation. Let's look at the motion graph here. So this is the, the staggered motion. So what happens is it's sort of swapping every other frame of animation, and you get sort of a sawtooth effect on the animation curve. Um, this one, depending on the frame rate we're getting through the webinar, you may not see it happening. Try it out yourself when you, you get Anime Studio 10, and you'll see that you get sort of this rough, noisy animation, which is a little more controllable than, than the noisy interpolation. And that's stagger. Um, the next thing I was going to talk about are some changes to the rendering system for Anime Studio 10. In the rendering system now, when you render a project, you go to export animation and you choose your, your output format and your rendering options. When you say OK and you render the result, the render window that pops up here, this was a quick render, so it's done now. But that is actually a separate process. Um, and what that means is it, it runs separately from Anime Studio. It's basically a separate program on your computer. And it means that the Anime Studio is, you're still free to work in Anime Studio. So if you have a long render, you can go on and, and render and work on your project. And the render shouldn't interfere. It, it's that the process runs at a lower priority, so you can still work in Anime Studio and the program should still be responsive. You can quit Anime Studio and the render will continue. 
This also applies um, to the, the batch export mode. So if you choose batch export here, you see what looks like the same batch export window with maybe a few changes, but it's actually a separate program. Um, so I could, I could go in here and quit Anime Studio and the batch exporter would still run. It just sort of makes for a cleaner way of, of uh, working with rendering projects, especially large projects. Um, Mike, I know, uh, quick question, I'm, I'm just going to jump in since you're sure. in between stuff. Um, there was a question about uh, location of the preview animation render and um, and, and your files. Um, I, I know it's different here when you're choosing your animation, your export animation or your batch render, you're choosing a location where those files go. Right. But um, when you're doing the preview animation, they were wondering where, where that movie may be located. Um, and when you render a single frame, like yeah, yeah. Uh, if I go in here and say um, preview, yeah, yeah. I don't think well we mentioned that, but there's a render cache. So what that means in Anime Studio 10 is every time you render a frame like this, um, it gets saved actually. So there you can click render cache here to display the location. And in here I have a whole bunch of files that I've rendered recently. So if I ever want to go back to anything, I have these all in here. And I don't know if those are the files that they were referring to. But if the preview animation was also. Well, I haven't even talked about the preview animation oh, yet. I'm but sorry. Um, <laughs> I guess they saw you preview. I'm oh, sorry. I oh, okay. Um, We'll get to that. It's a cool feature coming up soon. <laughs> but um, right now I'm going to talk about the drawing tools. There's some new drawing tools in Anime Studio. So um, the first one I'm going to talk about is the blob brush here. So the blob brush is a, a way to easily create uh, vector shapes, complex vector shapes. So I'm using it here. I have a, a Wacom tablet, pressure sensitive tablet, that as I draw, you can see it's kind of like just painting with a paint program. But when I let go of the mouse, um, it actually creates a vector shape. So if I select some of the vector tools, you can see that these are all points that can be edited later as vector points. Edited or animated, however you want. Let's go back to the blob brush tool. Um, you don't just create a single blob. You can go in, once you've created the blob, you can then modify it so I can um, create, you know, some kind of weird shape. I don't know what I'm drawing here, but um, it's sort of a, a tool you can build on what you've already got. There's a tool that goes with it, an eraser tool. You can select the eraser tool, or with the blob brush, you can hold down the command or control key to erase things. So I can erase parts of the blob that I've created. I can let go of the command key and I can paint them back. If you've got a Wacom tablet, you can go in and you can flip the pen over and erase, flip it over again and draw. So the blob brush is sort of a, gives you the freedom to paint and not worry about vector points as you're going. Now, the one thing it does, it, it creates quite a few vector points. So when you go back to these, you see that there are a lot of points in here. So a tool, a new tool in Anime 10 that goes along with this is the point reduction tool. So this one, you, you look at where there's more complexity than you want, and you paint over that region, and it'll delete a lot of the extra points. So you can see it tries to preserve the shape mostly, but gets rid of a lot of the extra points. So you, you don't have um, mountains and mountains of vector points to deal with. Um, these tools can also work with existing shapes. So if I have, um, let's say, a, a star or something, and I draw some shape, I can use these tools. Let's make it a little smaller. I can use these tools to modify that shape. And the way you do that, you first have to make sure the shape is selected with the Select Shape tool. 
And then if you take, say, the eraser tool, um, you can just erase part of the star. Or with the blob brush tool, I can go in and I can modify the star. So it makes any shape malleable and, uh, and paintable in this way. The paint bucket tool has also gotten some changes for Anime Studio 10. And the way the paint bucket tool has always worked, let's draw some shapes without, um, without any fill or stroke. If you have a region, a closed region, you can use the paint bucket tool to fill it with color. And that's, you know, maybe a handy way to, to fill a region with one click. But it, it has something more powerful it can do in Anime Studio 10. You can have a region that's more complex. So, um, let's say something like this. And now if I if I click in this area with the paint bucket tool, in previous versions of Anime Studio, you wouldn't be able to fill this region because it's not enclosed by a simple curve. There's multiple curves sort of overlapping. But with Anime Studio 10, if I click here, it finds that region based on the outlines and it fills that shape. So this is sort of a shape that it's a circle with a couple other ovals cut out of it and a rectangle. And that would be something that would be quite hard to create by editing point by point. But the paint bucket tool makes it easy. You just um, create whatever kind of wild shape you want. Um, fill a region and you get something that fits that region. So what that is, what it creates is an extra shape that you can then move around or you could leave it there maybe get rid of the original shapes that you were creating and now you have some shape that would have taken you several minutes to create uh, if you were editing it point by point. So that's what's new with the drawing tools. Um, let's look at the combined tools. So in Anime Studio 9 we combined the layer tools there was translate, scale, and rotate, and we combined them into a single tool. In Anime Studio 10, we've done the same thing with the point tools and the bone tools. So instead of translate, scale, and rotate points as separate tools, we have a single tool called the transform points tool. <clears throat> and the way it works is you can click a shape to select it, and then you get these handles around the shape. So if you click and drag inside the box or outside the box, you're translating a shape. If you click in the region between the two boxes, you're rotating a shape. And then you have these handles around the edge that let you scale a shape. The corner handles scale it evenly, and the side handles scale it sideways. Now if you don't have any points selected, what it, it, it goes back to sort of the old behavior where it moves the nearest point to where you click. So I can just click and reshape objects by moving points around. Or I can click on a shape and move it. So I click once and then drag it around, rotate it, scale it, whatever I want to do. We've also made it a little bit easier so you don't have to switch back to the select points tool if you don't want to. If you're using the transform points tool, and you hold down the command or control key, when you drag, you get, you're basically using the select points tool. So you can select a group of points and then move those around, or command drag to select another group and move that around. So that's how the, the point tools have been combined. The bone tools have also been combined into a single tool. Again, instead of translate, scale, and rotate, we have a single transform bone tool. And this tool, when you move over a skeleton, you can sort of see here how it's highlighting. The bone closest to the mouse gets these two handles on it. And if I click not on one of those handles, I'm rotating the bone. Here I'm at frame zero, so the shape isn't moving um, with me. Let's go into an animation frame. So I'm rotating the bone, or I can click on one of the handles. The handle at the base of the bone 
translates the bone, and the one at the tip scales the bone. And you can see um, the cursor changes as well. Here it's a rotation. Here the cursor is for translation and scale. So it's just a way to let you work without having to switch tools all the time. Um, let's actually, we're going to go back to a, um, a freehand, an update to the freehand drawing tool. So let's go back to our pressure sensitive tablet, make sure we're on pressure sensitivity. So in previous versions, when you drew with the freehand tool, you would um, you'd get sort of a rough looking preview of what you're getting, but now you actually see exactly what that, that shape is going to look like. So as I draw, I can see the, the pressure changes and I, uh, I know what the shape is going to look like as I draw, including, let's say, if I select a brush. So if I apply a brush to this stroke, I see all that happening as well. So I can uh, increase the, the pen width. Um, and the freehand tool now is just closer to what you're going to see in your final result. Just a nice little enhancement to the freehand tool. All right. Preview animation. I think this is something that came up in one of the questions a little while ago. Um, I'm going to open a complex file here. We saw this one earlier. This is the crustacea scene. So this is an animation that it's very complex, and so when you play it back in Anime Studio, it doesn't run very quickly. So you can see that it's a little bit jerky. So to see the full effect of the animation, like all the, the detailed movements, previously you'd have to render that out as a movie, and rendering a movie can take a long time, especially for something like this with a lot of layers and a lot of effects. But there's a new option. There's something in here called Preview Animation in the file menu. You can select it from the file menu or you can hold down the alt or option key and click the play button down here. And when we do preview animation, what happens is it looks like the project starts playing back. But what's happening, each frame is getting captured and saved into a movie. So you can see as they count down we're, we're capturing all these frames and it's, not, it's still not running very quickly, but that's about to get better when I stop. Um, this is running, I can tell you, much, much faster than a full render. A render would be, for this file, I'm not even sure, maybe 10 seconds per frame or something. So now we're getting a couple frames a second. So that's enough to demonstrate. I'm going to hit stop here. And then the movie that was captured comes up in your movie player. And I'm going to play this back. And I don't know how smoothly this is coming across in the webinar, but this is playing at, at normal speed for this animation. And it just took me a minute here to generate this preview animation. This is also useful if you're, if you're doing a tutorial or something, because a preview animation captures, um, captures everything that you see on the canvas. So if you have bones or something and you want to record all that to a movie, you can do that with preview animation as well. Uh, and um, I think that leads to the question we had, right, about where that file goes? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we were talking about the render cache before. The render cache is every time you render a frame like this, it actually gets saved to disk. And we save, um, I believe, 100 images. Um, that There's an option in the preferences, I think, for how many to save. Um, and then, then we start deleting them from this cache, so we won't fill up your hard drive. But the, the preview animations get saved in here as well. So um, what was that? 13. That's the file I was working on. So here's the preview animation for the crustacea scene that I rendered previously. It won't stay in that cache forever, but if you want to go back and get it, you can. Um, maybe that sort of answered the question about where the, the preview animation goes. 
All right. Let's see. Since I've had, I've been working through a bunch of sample files, now is a good time to talk about the tabs you may have noticed up here at the top. So Anime Studio 10 has the ability to open multiple documents, and you can go through them like I've been doing here. I've had them open and switch between documents, um, copy and paste between documents, work on multiple scenes and be able to jump back and forth between them. There's not a whole lot to say about it. It's a, a huge feature. I think it's going to be a great um, convenience for everybody working with Anime Studio, but it's, it's pretty much um, obvious how it works, I think, and um, I think you're going to love it, but I, I don't have a lot to say about it. It's tabs at the top, multiple documents. It's great. Another convenience feature we've been working on is um, shortcut mapping. So over the years, we've developed a lot of menu commands and a lot of tools with uh, shortcut keys. And you may or may not be interested in all these shortcuts that we have set up. So in Anime Studio 10, you can adjust these however you want. So let's say um, hide selected bones is a menu command that you use a whole lot. We have not set up a shortcut for this one, but you can. So the way you can do that is in the help menu, you can go in and select edit keyboard shortcuts. When you go in here, you have the default set. You can scroll through this list and you see the commands for every menu and every tool. Um, and it, now I'm going to set up my own set. So I'll click New and I'll call this Mike. And this is my set of keyboard shortcuts. It inherits the default shortcuts for everything to start with. And then if I want to modify one, I can scroll down this list or I can use this handy navigator here. I want to go to the bone menu. So I select this one and it just scrolls to the right location. Here's the bone menu. And I wanted to hide selected bones. So you'll select, you'll click in the, the field here and you'll type in the new command you want. I'm going to do command H and then click done whenever you're, you've made as many changes as you want. And then you can see um, I do. That's selected bones. Looks like a bug. Looks like a bug. Um, <laughs> I'm going to quit and restart. Um, Still not there? No, it's still not there. So I think Command H may be. Um, oh, you know what? Yes. Reserved. By it is reserved by the system. The Here's <laughs> Command H over here. But it shouldn't have allowed you to type in. No. So it still works. I tried this earlier. There, <laughs> but there, this is what I did instead. There are a few reserved things. For this demo, I meant to do Shift Command H. And now when I click Done, we're going to see that immediately hide selected bones. So um, we're going to actually get to that feature about hiding and showing bones in a little bit. But this is how you can adjust your shortcuts to work um, in a way that works with your favorite commands. You can adjust tool shortcut keys as well. Um, I, I know we're going to get to more questions at the end. This one's relevant on the spot, though. Um, mm -hmm. The question is, uh, you know, can the shortcut cuts be saved and shared? And yes, they can. Um, I don't have the information offhand to tell you where they're saved somewhere in your preferences. In your user folder, if you have one defined, it will save your shortcuts there. And you can take a file from uh, that folder and share it. Yeah, so the, the if, content location that you choose right. when you launch the application, you're going to be able to save uh, you know, brushes, your keyboard shortcuts are there, your render cache is there. Um, that's where all your additional uh, assets kind of get stored. Right. And including keyboard shortcuts. Thank you. Yeah. 
So this next feature is uh, multiple shape selection. Um, if you have multiple vector shapes and you wanted to edit the, you know, set, say, all the same color before, you'd have to select one, modify it, and then you could use the copy and paste buttons in the style palette, or you could use um, the color pushing features. But that was kind of a pain. So in Anime Studio 10, you can hold down the shift key with the select shape tool, and you can click to select multiple shapes at once. And then in the style panel, you can do things like you can edit the width for all those shapes, um, the stroke color for all those shapes at once, fill color, basically anything that we allow through the style panel can be applied to multiple shapes. So I can even put a gradient on all these shapes. So it just allows you to, to edit a whole bunch of shapes at once in a very easy way. Moving on, um, so a little change here to the sequencer. So here I have two animated characters, and let's say I want to use the sequencer to have this guy start further to the right. So I'm going to drag him back in time so that he just starts at the end here, has this little animation. And I want the monster to maybe wait a while before he starts his animation. So the sequencer is not new, but I'm just I'm walking through the sequencer here. So when I play it, the monster waited a little while before he started, and Mr. Bean here started towards the end of his animation. The new part is at frame zero. So it used to be that I moved the Mr. Bean character off to the left. So it means that his rigging frame, his frame zero, is now negative... 60 or whatever it is. Um, so if I wanted to change his rigging setup, I couldn't do that because I couldn't get to the rigging frame. The change is when you're on frame zero, every layer in the project goes back to its initial frame zero, its rigging frame. So I could go in and I could add, remove bones, change their initial angles, that kind of thing at frame zero. The same for the monster. And then when you go into the animation frames, they go into the actual animation. So it allows you to sequence things um, but still access the rigging frame at frame zero. We mentioned hiding points and bones when we were talking about the shortcut keys. Um, here's how that works. If you have a complex scene, this one is obviously not that complex, what you can do is you can select some points and then you can, in the draw menu, say hide selected points. Let's say I only want to work on the red shape. I might select the green and the blue and hide those points. Now when I start using the drawing tools, all I can work on is the red shape because the points for the green and the blue are hidden, so there's no way I can accidentally mess them up. Um, it, it's a way of isolating part of your drawing so you can work on another part and uh, make things a little simpler. You can show them all again, and now the blue and the green points are visible, so I can edit those shapes again as well. Similar thing works for bones. Um, here we have a lot of bones, and I've set them up so that the, the limbs of this tree-like thingy move automatically with the smart bone at the root. So because they're automatic, I really don't need to see them. So I can select all these bones up here and say hide selected bones. And now they're gone. I mean, they're there, but they're hidden. So they, they still move and they still control the artwork underneath. But there's no need to see them all the time. And I believe some of the included artwork in the library has bones hidden. So that to just sort of reduce some of the complexity, you get the animation in there the only parts you're interested in controlling are, are the visible bones. GPU acceleration. Um, there's not a lot to, to demonstrate here. I've been using it the whole time, but um, we now make use of the GPU to uh, help draw things on the canvas. So the result is you get faster performance and higher quality 
especially for images. You know, these are all image layers, and we get nice, uh, high quality on those because we're using uh, the GPU or your graphics card. We use it with vector layers as well, and it's a display option down here, GPU acceleration. You can turn it on or off if you don't want it on for some reason. Generally, things run faster. Um, there are some cases with lots and lots of vector shapes where it may not run faster. You might want to turn GPU off, but basically it's taking advantage of the hardware you have on your system. Editing multiple layers. Let's do this one quick. So here's a cool effect. This is a built-in effect um, in the scripting menu. It's a way to just have text transition into a scene. But the result of this effect is that it creates lots and lots of layers. So you here in the layers panel, you can see I've got a lot of layers. Now suppose I wanted to make a change to all of these layers, like I wanted to make it 3D. So I go to the 3D options and I say extrude this layer. Okay, which one was that? That was the letter Y. And now I want to do it for this one and the next one. But what you can do in Anime Studio 10 is select them all, go to the layer settings dialog, and any changes you make here will apply to all of them. So you can say extrude and apply. And there's a note down here, multiple layers are selected. Changes will be applied to all as applicable. So Instead of having to go through all 25 of these and set them up, um, I just selected a bunch of layers and made the change. So now I have a 3D text transition effect. Variable width curves. We've made a change to variable width curves because there are some people who've um, been using fat lines as a way to create limbs for characters. So here's a little weird character that um, instead of using bones or shapes along the outlines, this is just a single curve that has a fat line applied to it. And the change is that if you wanted two lines, it was previously it was difficult to do that. But now it's really easy to create. I just draw a line with the Create Shape tool, I um, apply, create a shape there that's a line. And now what I can do is I can select that again and create another shape. And I'm going to make this one a black line. And I'm going to send it to the back, make it a little bit fatter. And now I have what could be a limb for a character. And the variable with line change means that when I modify these points, both shapes get that change. So not only can you create limbs, but you can create limbs with variable width and sort of more style to them that way. So it's an interesting approach some people have taken here to creating uh, body parts for characters. It's actually kind of cool. It gives you an old style cartoony look. I think we have a question. Hi, guys. I just wanted to uh, mention to you that uh, we'll be taking questions at the very end, so please feel free to ask as many questions as you can. Uh, we still have several features to go over, and we're near, nearing the end of the webinar, so please ask questions as you can. Go ahead, Ben. All right. I have some cool stuff I still want to show you, so hopefully I can get through it all. Here's uh, some changes to brushes. So first of all is brush quality. Um, I'm just showing you this quickly. This is uh, a, a great improvement to brush quality, especially when you have brushes with hard edges or they get very tiny, the, the result is still looks really nice. And that's an improvement in Anime Studio 10. The GPU also makes brushes look good on the canvas. The bigger change to brushes is, is what we call multi-brushes. So let's um, create a new line shape here. I'm going to make a shape out of this, a fat shape, and I'm going to apply a brush. So we have some new brushes, and that there's a new indicator here. Any brush that has little dots in the corner, that means that it's a multi-brush. And a multi-brush, so previously brushes would use a single image and stamp that image along the curve. A multi-brush has multiple images. 
and I can make this obvious by spacing them out. You can see that the brush I've applied here has different kinds of hatch shapes. And when I pack them closer together, the idea is it's supposed to give you more variation in your brushes. So you get sort of a more variable looking brush. And, and that's a, just sort of, it gives us a new look available with this version. We have some down here provided by one of our users, some special effects kinds of brushes. Here's sort of a rainbow effect, um, shading effects. You can use those uh, to shade your artwork. Um, and you can create these multi brushes yourself. Here's one for grass. A multi brush is basically just a folder with multiple brush images inside it and then they can get randomly chosen along the brush. Texture, transparency, um, 23. So here I have three layered vector shapes and if I select the top one and use the image texture effect, select a texture image. This texture has transparency in it, so you can th see through the holes, and what you see is the underlying pink shape. This is a new option, just one checkbox, through transparency. So what that means is the transparency will now show through the object. So I still have the oval shape here, but all I see is the texture that's been applied to it, clipped to the oval shape. That's just one checkbox. I'll move on to the next one. I didn't want to miss this one. Particle sources this is a cool effect. So here's a, a particle layer. I'll play a little animation of it. Um, particles have always had a source, and that source is an oval shape. But what if you don't want an oval? So this is something new. If you want the particles to come from a shape that you define, what you do is you create a new vector layer. So here's the shape that I want the particles to fly out of. I add the vector layer to the particle layer. And then the first thing I'll see immediately is that vector layer has become a particle. So I need to tell it, don't use that as a particle, use that as a source. So there's two places I can do that, with the particle tool that has all the particle options, or in the layer settings dialog. And the option I want is use base layer as source. So when I check that, we'll close this uh, dialog, the particles are now flying outwards from that curvy blob shape. So this is a, a way to have a lot more control over how your particle layers are created. So this shape at the base of the particle layer is now the source instead of just an oval for particles. Um, the threshold effect. The threshold effect is something that sort of applies most places that we have blurring. So let's turn, a, turn on a shadow, a drop shadow for this layer. The drop shadow is kind of this blurry copy of the layer shifted down to the side. But there's a new option here, the shadow threshold. So if I turn on shadow threshold and I render this again, you can see that that blurry layer has been thresholded. And what that does, it sort of rounds off the edges, rounds off the corners. We also have that available in layer shading. So if I shade a layer on the inside of the shape, I can turn on the shading threshold, and that one also gets rounded off. So you can use that in shading effects. You can also use it in on an entire layer. So here are just a few circles I've drawn and I've animated them moving around. And I have a threshold option here in compositing effects. So the threshold really works best in combination with the blur. So I'm going to blur this layer. If we blur it, you know, it just looks like that when it's rendered a blurry bunch of circles. But if I set a threshold, 128 is sort of the midpoint, what it does is it sort of smooths out those blurred blobs altogether. So it's, smir it's um, 
it's thresholding the red, green, and blue channels is why we're seeing these funny color effects. So there's another new feature we can use together with that, it's colorize layer. So colorize layer takes all the contents of the layer, fills it with whatever color I choose here. And I can combine that with maybe an outline as well. And now when I render it, I get a nice blob. I like blobs, but um, here's why you might want blobs. This is the that same file just um, rendered and played back as an animation. So you can make, I can imagine, water effects, smoke, um, slime trails, all kinds of blobby effects using the combination of um, blur threshold and colorizing layers. We actually have a couple included. This is one I've rendered out, but this is a particle effect included in the content library. This is a cartoony, magical sort of fire effect. Thanks to, to uh, Victor Paradis for creating this one. Um, this is using Threshold, and I just rendered it out to see what the result would look like. The last feature I want to show you today is uh, an improvement to the depth of field effect. So I don't know if you were all aware of this feature, but in project settings, we have a setting for depth of field. And I can turn this on. And depth of field means you have a certain focal distance. And things that are this far away from the camera will be in sharp focus. Things that are closer or further away get more and more blurry. And that's to simulate a camera depth of field. The problem is it's tricky to use because how do you know what value to enter here? How, what is the focal distance you want? So we have something here. If you turn the camera to the side, or if, I, or if I orbit the whole scene to the side, I can see that this is a 3D scene, and here is the camera. This box represents the, the focus region, and this line here is the focal distance. If I go into project settings, these will update live. I can change the focal distance. See, I want this little character here to be in focus. So I'm, I'm just adjusting the, the numerical values. And instead of typing new numerical values, this is something that's a, a useful tip. If you have a, a scroll wheel on your mouse, you can just go over a numerical field and roll up and down to, to try different values. So now the character is on the focal plane and I can adjust the focus range to bring it in close so only the character is going to be in focus. That looks good. I would click OK, go back to the camera view, and now when I render just that, uh, that view, you can see that the, the clouds in the background are blurred out. The character is in focus, and I think in this particular frame we don't have anything that's um, much closer than the character to show close things out of focus. But um, but yeah, it's a, it's a way to preview how that uh, focal range is going to work. It just makes it easier to see what it's going to do, hopefully a little more usable. And that's um, the last feature I wanted to show you for the webinar. <clears throat> if we're ready for some questions, we've got some. Well, there's a whole bunch of questions. I, okay. <laughs> I hope we can get to most of them. Um, if not, we can probably try to answer them at Lost Marble. Maybe we'll address on that as, as well. on Facebook. We'll address that at the end of the webinar. Thank you. Um, okay, Mike, the first question we have here is um, if I have a chain of three bones, can I use the bone pair for the elbow bend? So they're wondering, you showed like yes. an AB and a B. And they wonder if they can link multiple bones and do that bend. You can only two bones can be used for the bend, but you can have uh, bones attached before and after those two. Um, actually, here so, I, so one, they, one of the characters does use that. I can okay. bring that up. Um, uh, this guy uses that. So the legs in particular. 
um, what am I doing here? I want to move this out. So the there are several bones here. There's one in the thigh, the shin, and the foot, and the target as well. These two bones, the thigh and the shin, have that smooth joint effect applied across this region. But then there are other bones down at the end that are not part of that smooth blend. Like the foot is uh, separate from the, the knee bend. Could they make that joint there a smooth blend as well? This one? Yeah. Well, the smooth blend applies to um, the artwork, not mm -hmm. the bones specifically. So you could, if you had another layer that was connecting these two, um, it could be used that way. Okay. It just the restriction is the bones have to start out straight. So in this example, it's not good because the the shin and the the foot are bent. But if the if the foot started out close to in line with the shin, then you could create a smooth joint here as well. Okay. Wonderful. Yes, there was a few questions related to that. Yeah. It's going to be a popular feature, I think. Um, I'll be happy to follow up with a lot more detail on that in the forum. Later. Okay. Um, can smartphone dials be used to control switch layers? Yes. Um, okay. um, let's see, what else do we got here? There was a, yeah, the question asked me to demonstrate it. I think, I don't know that I have time to do that, but I can look for that on the forum as well, I think. Do we have any uh, uh, sample videos that might demonstrate? I believe so, yes. Uh, one of Chad's latest videos shows the improvement to smartphones and goes over how smartphones control uh, more than just bones. So yes, we can provide some of that link. There's a, bu there's a bunch of uh, videos up on anime.smithmicro.com um, and uh, the cover plethora of the new features, so hopefully they cover some of this um, that we're just touching on as well. Mm -hmm. um, can color be staggered? Yes. Yes. Um, here's another question. Does the, does the bounce interpolation have a squash and stretch to the ball like a real bouncing ball? Um, the bounce in, the bounce interpolation no it does not um, it interpolate or the bounce applies to a single parameter so it's controlling the translation of the ball um, in, in that example I used it to look like a bouncing ball but you could bounce diagonally or you could bounce rotation so you could have you know the moon orbit in the earth in a bouncy kind of way so it's sort of it's a mathematical bounce, not a a bouncing ball specifically. You'd have to add in um, a scaling effect to to do the squash and stretch, and possibly some point movement or something. Yeah, you could do it. You can do it pretty well with um, with with scaling a layer. Here's a, a little tip: when you scale a layer in one direction, if you hold down the Alt key it causes it to scale in the opposite direction. So you get a nice squash and stretch effect here. But you'd have to add in, you'd have to scale it when you wanted it to do the scale. Right, mix that with the bounce interpolation and it makes everything really right. easy. Great. Um, let's see. Um, somebody's wondering if they can select a range of frames and apply stagger to it. The stagger applies between, you, so you apply it to one keyframe, and so it, it applies from that keyframe to the next. So if you want to apply it further, then you would select multiple keyframes and apply stagger to multiple keyframes at once. OK. So there, um, could you show them how to select multiple keyframes? Yeah. Just in case. So let's say this shape is going to move. Um, to the side and then downwards. You can click and drag an outline around multiple keyframes. Or if you want to select all the keyframes in a channel, you just click the channel icon and it selects all the keyframes. And now I could right click and say stagger. And so this keyframe is staggering to the next one, and this one is staggering to the next one, and this one as well. 
So now I, I get a stagger the whole way. And if my screen is, yeah, it must still be shared. You can combine stagger with an interval effect. So if I'm um, animating on threes and I have a stagger, I'm going to get a really pronounced stagger, which for this oval is, I don't know, interesting, but it illustrates the point. So here's the, here's inter uh, animating on threes with a stagger applied as well. So you get a very significant stagger effect which could be useful in some cases. Okay. Can the amount of frequency of staggering be controlled? No. Uh, well, sort of through this by changing the, um, the interval. But uh, otherwise it's just sort of uh, swaps every other frame. Um, there is a question about SVG import, um, and um, I guess they're just wondering: does it S does it import SVG? Has there been any changes or improvements there? There, um, I don't think there have been any changes for Anime 10. There are some some SVG files contain things like interactivity and animation, and we don't support that. So, you an SVG file exported by a drawing program like Inkscape or uh, Illustrator is the best way to go. Not to say like a, a game that you find on a website with it, you know, made with SVG, that's probably not going to import. Yeah, it'll, it'll, great. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. There, there's definitely some details there that get saved into some SVGs that we don't support. Uh, Inkscape saves every image as a, a, every color fill as a gradient, and uh, oh, okay. we don't import those gradients. So. If you're seeing some discrepancy with your SVG when you import, it, it's probably because there's a feature there that isn't supported. Um, there's a question about texture transparency. Is the color based on the stroke or the color of the texture? Um, is it possible to change the color of the texture after the fact? Yes, after the fact. Um, Whenever we use transparency in Anime Studio, it's based on an alpha channel. So this file in particular um, is just something I actually, I think I sketched it in Anime Studio and rendered it, but the, the holes that you see through are, um, their alpha is set to zero. So you can have partial transparency as well. This one doesn't have it, but if you have semi-transparent regions, those will get, those are supported as well. It's, it's not about the color. If you go in and you later edit the texture in an image editing program, you can change the colors however you want. You can make more areas transparent, whatever. It just um, ping, PNG images are sort of the recommended uh, format for supporting alpha channels. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, sure. And while we're on images, um, there's a question about brushes, and can you render the brushes without jitterness? Um, well, there are there are options for that. Um, so let's quickly bring, create a brush shape here. So there are options here if you want. Um, I'm not sure which jitterness they mean exactly, but I can make it so that they don't rotate. So this one has, they're all aligned or aligned with the curve, and so that now there's not that randomness. There's also this minimize frame to frame randomness. And what that does, it removes the sort of random jumping around stuff that brushes do. But the one thing it can't remove is, let's say you make a brush longer or shorter, it's going to need, or especially if you do it this way, like in the middle, it's going to need to add or take away uh, sort of instances of the brush, stamps of the brush. So it's going to, here there, it looks like there's maybe five or six brushes along the curve. But as I make it longer, it's obviously going to need to take more to fill out the curve. 
um, and that's going to introduce a little bit of um, jittering effect, I guess, as the brush changes. And that can happen in more subtle ways, too, if I, if I move the curve just a little bit. But this is probably what you want to look for, is try to minimize frame-to-frame -frame randomness. Oh, turn off random order, too, for multi-brushes. Um, I'm just looking through the list here. Let's see. So there's a question about scripts. Um, can uh, if if you're using additional scripts in Anime Studio, Lua scripts, um, can can you assign short? Can you use shortcuts and assign shortcuts for those? Uh, like a command S, well, type of thing. Um, I don't believe so. I think all command key well, shortcuts are. The, um, the the shortcut you can you can assign the shortcut to trigger a tool, um, even if it's a custom tool. As far as what you use in your uh, your tool itself, tracking key events, um, if it's used somewhere else first, then you'll never see the event. Um, if somebody has already created a keyboard shortcut for another action and your uh, script depends on it, then you may never see that event. Um, I believe we did reserve something for scripts, but I can't remember off the top of my head what that was. Okay, I'd have thank, to go you. Back on the thank you, Eric. Um, there was another question about, about Lua and scripting. Um, uh, are we still using the same version of Lua? Does that affect scripting at all? Um, we did update the version of Lua we use. Um, we updated to the latest version at the time of development, which was I don't I don't recall the what the latest version was. It meant that there were a few changes to scripting, a couple things you have to do differently. Um, most scripts did not have to be changed, so for the most part, it, it doesn't change anything. Um, improvements, there we've exposed some new functionality, especially things that were used by, say, the blob tool, the eraser, um, some of the things that our own tools needed support for. So the latest scripting interfaces are included with the installer. OK, thank you. Um, there's there's still a bunch of questions here. I don't know if we're going to get to all of them, but um, there was one more one more here. Um, um, they were wondering um, you had the yellow the yellow character animation character up, and um, yeah, that was you were using one. the blob brush tool here. They were wondering how you no. combine shapes without without the edge. Ah, so this was not the blob brush actually. Okay, this okay. is. Um, so let's say the body is one, one shape here. There, it's got a, a fill and an outline. The limbs are two shapes. There's a yellow curve and a black curve. The black curve um, was sent all the way to the back. So here it is where you have the body and then the black curve and then the yellow curve. But if I select, so here I select the yellow curve. Here I select the black curve. If I take the black curve, and I was using keyboard shortcuts, but if I say uh, lower to back, it now goes behind the body. And in effect, it means that the yellow arm and the yellow body blend together. And so as I move the points around, it's sort of uh, an automatic blending of, of wherever I, I move that to. It's a, it's a cheap trick, but it works well. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so are we are we about out of time here, I think? No, let's uh, go on for a little bit more, and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, close uh, the webinar off. Did you have any questions coming I, I actually do, yes. Uh, I, I've been answering questions uh, via messaging here, but uh, 
here's a question that's come through, Mike. Um, can I copy and paste keyframes from a document into another, let's say from a bone to the bone of another document? No, you can't. Keyframes can only be um, only copy and pasted within a single layer of the same document. Okay. Uh, the next question is, is it possible to animate an imported picture? Yeah. That's, um, there's a lot of ways to import or to animate an imported picture, but that's um, looking for the file. That's how this guy was created. So this guy was drawn um, watercolor, I think, and, and all these parts are, are imported pictures. So these are not vector shapes. These are scanned pictures. They could be photographs just as easily as they're hand-drawn stuff. And so they can be um, animated with bones. You can bend them. Um, animate them in various ways. Yeah, make them fly around. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mike. So we'll answer a few more questions, and then uh, we'll wrap up uh, the webinar because we're getting close to the hour and a half mark. Uh, so Jason, go ahead. Um, the question is, uh, how do you create the opposite smartphone using one bone? Um, and their question is regarding open and closed mouth. Does this render the smartphone script obsolete with this new option? Is that the smart, um, I don't know the specific smartphone script that they're referring to, but I'll show you how you do it with the built-in option. So um, this is the file I used before I made the the star go from uh, blue to green and curvy and stuff. So let's do uh, something a little different. When I say make smart bone dial, it defaults to the angle range is minus 90 to 90. So let's call this um, uh, mood and I'm going to try and make a star smile. So there are two extremes. So there's to the left and the right and then there's the center position. So I would go to the center and let's say I'd add a keyframe for these points. And then at one extreme, I'm going to take the points and I'm going to try and make a sad, frowny star. And at the other extreme, I'm going to take the points and I'm going to make a happy star. It kind of looks happy. All right. So now I have a smart bone that has um, two extremes, sad or happy. So you can you can use that with the the built-in uh, make smart bone dial thing like that. You just have to set up the two extremes in your in the whatever you're controlling. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> And then I think uh, there may be, uh, hopefully I didn't miss any questions there. If we did, um, we'll, we'll try to address them at, at the locations that we mentioned earlier. Um, one last question here today. Um, you only can, use, can you only use stagger interpolation as an in effect or could you use it as an out effect as well? So all of our interpolation works. Um, where is it? Oh, I want to see some keyframes. From one keyframe to the next. So, for example, here, if I apply um, linear interpolation, that applies from this keyframe to the next. If I want it to go on this side, I have to go to the previous keyframe. So I think in answer to that, it's, it's always an in effect. If you want it for the out point, you'd go to the previous keyframe. And you see it sort of um, marked here from this keyframe to the right. So that's indicating that it's coming out from this keyframe, but this previous one means the stagger also applies going into this keyframe. So okay. hopefully that. Thank you. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you very much, Mike, for uh, all the great work.
as well as uh, all the other engineers that uh, spent so much time in uh, developing Anime Studio uh, 10. I would uh, like to let everyone know that attended the webinar uh, that thank you very much for uh, spending the last hour and a half with us. We totally appreciate it. Um, also wanted to thank uh, Jason for all the hard work in QAing this uh, version of our uh, product. Uh, we're very excited with the launch and uh, with Michi for helping us with, uh, with the actual presentation and, uh, and all other things related to Facebook and, and all the other good goodies. If you'd like more information on Anime Studio, please, please go to anime.smithmicro.com. There's a ton of new videos in there. We have some very high quality tutorials that you guys can check out. If you have any questions, feel free to jump on to lostmarvel.com. Uh, there's a discussion area that's the formal or official discussion area for Anime Studio. And you can ask your questions. There's still a ton of questions that we can go through because um, we're just running out of time. So make sure to ask your questions there. We also have a Facebook page that you can definitely like and check out and ask questions up there too. We'll be answering questions um, anybody posts up there. Uh, as well, if you'd like to get access to the video uh, for this particular webinar, it will be up on the link that you see in front of you at my.smithmicro.com forward slash webinars. We will also ask Mike to provide us his sample files and we'll post it up on um, either Lost Marvel or on, uh, on Facebook, wherever we can, so that you guys can have access to those. And um, like I mentioned earlier, the official forum for Anime Studio is lostmarble.com. Finally, if you haven't joined our email list, please make sure to subscribe to our email list. We have the best deals on there. So uh, the link is available and is in front of you. And for those of you who have websites or uh, uh, or, or our instructors, or, or, or have uh, a way to uh, promote Anime Studio, please feel free to join our affiliate program. You can spread the word and make some money. Uh, the link to the affiliate program is available there as well. And if you are a teacher or a student, we do have educational pricing through our campus store. Uh, the link is at the bottom of uh, the presentation here that you can see. So please make sure to uh, go there if you'd like to get uh, Anime Studio. Anywho, thank you very much. We want to say thank you to everybody that joined us today. Uh, thank you for spending the last little bit of time with us. We hope you enjoy Anime Studio 10, and we look forward to the next webinar. Thank you.